My name is Roy Elliott, President of the Highlands Chamber of Commerce. We welcome you today to the educational documentary on the history of Highlands. We feel that it's important to preserve the history of our town. It has been said that if one loses his history, he loses his identity. In order to preserve our history and our identity, we are in the process of creating the Highlands Heritage Museum and Preservation Project. Its charter arm will be the Chamber of Commerce, but it will function independently. What you are about to see is the beginning of this endeavor. In a panoramic glimpse across time, you would have seen the Karakawa Indians, the pirate Jean Lafitte, Sam Houston's army, en route to the Battle of San Jacinto, the Confederate forces passing through on their way to retake Galveston Island in 1863, big orchards, fields of strawberries, an adventurous entrepreneur and risk taker named Harry K. Johnson, who built the railroads that solidified the growth in our area a canning plant that provided many of the jobs, and as Rhino Pack still does today, and a myriad of small businesses, some of who are a distant memory, and some who prospered and are still here today. I would like to extend my thanks to those who have put their time and effort and resources into this project, which was, by the way, no easy task. The first people to live in the area known today as Highlands were a group of Indians called by the Spanish explorers the Caroncoas. The Caroncoas were a very nomadic and warlike tribe of Indians that spent much of their time hunting and fishing along the rivers and bays which extend along the Texas Gulf Coast, stretching from the Trinity River to the Natchez River. These Indians were known to live along the coast during the warmer summer months of the year and then move inland during the winter months to live. The Spanish explorer, Cabeza de Vaca, noted in his journal that they subsisted mainly on deer, fish, and oysters, and were very proficient with the bow and arrow. They lived in thatched huts made of willow poles, tied with thongs to form an oval framework over which skins and woven mats were thrown. They had little clothing, and did much of their traveling by canoes, which they fashioned from the hollowed out tree trunks. These aboriginal people were also known to produce very ornate pottery vessels of clay in which they did their cooking. Remains of these vessels and artifacts can be found along the banks of the San Jacinto River today. Early settlers began arriving into the region in the 1820s. By this time, most of the local Indian population began disappearing due to disease and war. The first pioneers on the San Jacinto River had very little trouble with Indians except in late 1822 when a small group of Caroncoas who were camped near the mouth of Little Cedar Bow lured some unsuspecting settlers ashore with a white flag as they traveled up the river. When the unsuspecting group reached the shore, the Indians killed all of them except for one man who escaped and soon returned with 12 other well-armed settlers. Upon locating the Indian camp, they found the Indians busy cooking parts of their victims. This so outraged the settlers that they attacked and killed some 20 of the Indians. During this same period, peaceful Cushati Indians who lived on the Trinity River often visited the San Jacinto River settlements to trade venison for both bread and manufactured items such as trade knives and cooking utensils. The pirate, Jean Lafitte, who operated from a base on Galveston Island, attacking Spanish ships along the Texas coast often used the timber which lined the shores of the upper San Jacinto River as both a hiding place and careening place to repair his ships. He left the area in 1821. However, some of his men who had tired of a life of piracy chose to stay and settle in the area. An early pioneer, Moses Austin, negotiated a land contract in December 1820 with the Spanish government who controlled Texas. His intention was to bring 300 frontiersmen and settlers to Texas from the United States to raise cotton and cattle. Moses Austin died at his home in Missouri the following year, leaving the responsibility of fulfilling the contract to his son, Stephen F. Austin. Mexico, who won its independence from Spain in 1821, still honored Austin's contract. Austin, hoping to make money from selling the huge land grants he received from the Mexican government, began selling tracts of land to the newly arriving families from the United States. He began offering land at 12 and a half cents per acre. The Austin grant encompassed much of the Brazos and Colorado watersheds as well as the land along the San Jacinto River. The first settler to claim the land along the San Jacinto River 
in the area that would one day become Highlands was a settler named Reuben White. He was the oldest son of William and Amy White. Born on October 28, 1795, he moved to Texas with his mother and received 4,428 acres of land on the east bank of the San Jacinto River on August the 19th of 1824. Reuben White, one of Austin's original 300. Reuben and his wife, Christina Falk White, appeared on the Atascocita census of July 1826. Another family member, Jesse White, who was born March 4, 1796, the second son of William and Amy White, arrived in Texas about 1829 or 1830. He received property also located on the east side of the San Jacinto River between his brother, George White's grant, and the south property line being Nathaniel Lynch's land grant. George White, born September 30, 1800, the third son of William and Amy White, received a grant of land October 7, 1835, approximately where the present Banana Bend subdivision is now located. At the time, the White family and other pioneers began settling on land along the San Jacinto River. A town was beginning to be established at the river crossing known as Lynchburg. This early frontier settlement consisted only of a few log cabins which had been constructed near a ferry landing established at a crossing on the San Jacinto River and operated by Nathaniel Lynch. Nathaniel Lynch was granted a license for the ferry crossing in 1830. Nathaniel Lynch used his home as an inn for travelers and served as a combination town mayor and justice of the peace. He soon sold 15 acres to David G. Burnett, who had arrived with his wife in 1830. Burnett soon built a home and a sawmill on the high bluff overlooking what would be called Burnett Bay in 1831. He would become the first president of the Republic of Texas in 1836. In 1836, Mexican President General Santa Ana arrived in the area after defeating the Texan Army at the Battle of the Alamo. He wanted to stop the growing movement to make Texas an independent country and to enforce the hated ban on Anglo-American immigration to Texas, which he himself had imposed on the Texans. Santa Ana's plan was to cross the Lynch's Ferry and continue laying waste to all the settlements in his path, having already burned Harrisburg just a little way upstream on the Buffalo Bayou. During this time, several thousand settlers had gathered at Lynch's Ferry, fleeing Santa Ana's army. Many of the settlers were able to make their way to the town of Liberty and beyond in what is called the Runaway Scrape. However, General Sam Houston and his army of frontiersmen reached the ferry before Santa Ana. The Texan forces sent the ferry to the other side for safekeeping and stationed a few men to guard it. On the following day, Houston's forces defeated Santa Ana's army at the Battle of San Jacinto, thus winning independence for the Republic of Texas. With Santa Ana's defeat, the settlers could return to their homes. Many settlers went home to rebuild what Santa Ana destroyed. Texas gained her independence later and joined the United States. The years following were prosperous ones for many residents along the San Jacinto River as they continued raising cattle and cotton in the rich, fertile soil. With statehood, more money was brought into the area. Investments were made in various industrial and agricultural ventures. The town of Lynchburg grew in size and became an important seaport and shipping center. The first railroad to reach the area was completed in 1859, crossing the San Jacinto River near the present town of Crosby, extending from Houston to Orange on the Sabine River. This railroad was built to aid the growing agricultural industrial boom then occurring along the Texas Gulf Coast. However, this railroad would play a very important role in the moving of troops and supplies for the Confederacy when Texas entered the Civil War in 1861. Many local settlers from the surrounding area served in the Confederacy from 1861 to 1865. The Confederate Army stationed a small cavalry unit near the railroad bridge that crossed the San Jacinto River in order to prevent sabotage by the Union troops then occupying Galveston Island in 1862. The Confederate Navy would often bring boats up the San Jacinto River and hide them in White's Lake to prevent their capture by the Federal forces. These gunboats, Bio City and Neptune, used in the recapture of Galveston Island from Federal forces in January 1863, were constructed at the shipyards located at the town of Lynchburg. After the Civil War, the economy was very bad. Most people had lost a lot of money during the war, and times were hard. Reconstruction in Texas would take its toll on the residents who had lived along the San Jacinto River, and many families would not recover until almost the turn of the century. But 
the San Jacinto River and Buffalo Bayou would remain a very important shipping and industrial center for the state of Texas and would soon recover and emerge as one of the largest shipping ports in Texas. Born in Louisville, Kentucky, in September 1863, Harry K. Johnson obtained a degree in civil engineering from the University of the South at Sewanee, Tennessee, and began his career on street railways in 1885. In 1901, he became the builder and owner of the street railway in Beaumont, Texas. Before beginning the Houston North Shore, he was involved in building seven different railroads, six of which were electric lines, and a few were in urban roads located in Mississippi, Texas, and Louisiana. In 1924, he visited Alena, Texas. With the low-cost land between Houston and Baytown, he and his associates bought or obtained options on approximately 8,000 acres of land that extended from Carpenter's Bayou to Cody. Now an electric and urban railway would provide passenger service for land sales and provide freight service for the growing needs of Baytown. In January of 1925, Harry K. Johnson requested financial assistance and cooperation with terminal facilities from the Missouri Pacific Railroad, but was rejected. He then turned to the Southern Pacific Railroad, who was very interested, and agreed to lend Johnson $75,000 to connect Baytown with Crosby from Hawaiian Highlands. With only a verbal agreement, the construction from Crosby to the south and from Baytown west towards Alina began. A Southern Pacific engineer laid out the rail lines, constructed plans for the rail yard, and connections at Crosby. Shortly afterwards, the Southern Pacific backed out of this agreement. In June 1925, the Houston North Shore was granted a state charter for its intention to build a railway. Grade work was going on for the Crosby Line and the route from Baytown to Alena. Harry K. Johnson turned his attention back to the Missouri Pacific for assistance. In an atmosphere of each party having various interests in building the railway, an agreement was made in July of 1926. Johnson was to receive cash for an option to purchase the outstanding capital stock of the HNS and purchase at par all of the outstanding bonds to raise capital to complete the railroad. Johnson was also to sell the Baytown Houston Railroad at cost to the Missouri Pacific which would allow him to develop the huge land holdings in the area. At the time, Land on the undeveloped north side of Houston Ship Channel was selling for $600 per acre, as compared to the south side selling for $5,000 an acre. It was estimated that the Baytown refinery would generate 13,000 cars of traffic for the HNS. All this was in addition to passenger service to the area before a highway connected the east shore of the San Center to Houston. By October 1925, grading had been completed between Baytown and Alina to the banks of the San Jacinto River. Rails were expected for delivery. A contract for two substations and 15 miles of overhead electrical service had been closed. Acquisition of electric locomotives and four interurban cars was being discussed. Construction slowed and then stopped by the end of 1925 with a small frame freight and passenger station erected at Alina. By June 1926, right of way for 80% of the route had been attained. About 15 miles of grade was complete, and two miles of track had been laid from the Humble Oil office in Baytown. With agreement with the Missouri Pacific in July of 1926, it was decided to concentrate on the Baytown to Houston route with intentions to connect to the HB&T at the Market Street Spur. The completion of the tracks between Baytown and Highlands in August culminated in a celebration dinner for the rail construction crews, the railway owners, and residents of Highlands, formerly named Alina. The first steam train to arrive in Highlands on August 24, 1926. Contracts were in place for the interurban cars for delivery in December for electrical power from Houston Lighting and Power and for construction of the San Jacinto River Bridge. In November 1926, electric poles, bracket arms, and messenger wire were in place from Baytown to the San Jacinto River. The Wooster substation and the Highland substation construction was in progress. Pile drivers were working on the San Jacinto River Bridge trestle. The San Jacinto River Bridge was constructed at a height of 25 feet over the river, not to impede water navigation, requiring a length of 4,379 feet the longest railroad bridge in Texas during its time. The portion crossing the river channel itself was a steel through Warren truss span of 160 foot length. Construction was to be complete by mid-December. 
In November 1926, preparations of the right-of-way on the west side of the river was going strong with over 500 men in service. On November 22, 1926, the Houston Chamber of Commerce were given a tour of the Houston North Shore Railway. The 51 men in the group were taken to the St. Jacinto River by automobile, where they were served at lunch by Mrs. Harry K. Johnson and other ladies. Crossing the river by boat, they were taken by auto to the Baytown Refinery and back to Highlands. From Highlands back to the San Jacinto River, they were transported by a work train. Because of rains, the construction slowed through December 1926 and into January of 1927. An application was filed with the ICC in January of 27 by the BSL and WMP for the purchase of the capital stock owned by Harry K. Johnson. The last spike for the rail connection between Baytown and Houston was driven on January 28th of 1927 near the west side of the San Jacinto River Bridge. This made the Houston North Shore Railway the final railroad to enter Houston. The first steam engine pulling 32 ballast cars from Houston came into Highlands on Monday, January the 31st, 1927. This ballast was needed to improve the condition of the track. Limited and formal passenger service between Baytown and Highlands was begun using two Dayton, Covington, and Pickway DCMP cars. Railroad and refinery workers were the first riders. By the end of February 1927, all work on the San Jacinto River Bridge was complete except for the guardrails. Construction of the Durham Yard connection with the Umbalo Railroad was underway and trolley wire nearly completed to Houston. The new electric locomotive number 39, later designated as the number 512, was delivered at the end of March. The overhead lines were finished between Market Street and Baytown. The ICC approved the acquisition of the railway from Harry K. Johnson to be effective May 1st, 1927. Wanting to establish freight service as soon as possible, limited operations began on May 1st, 1927, with the first crude oil tank cars arriving at the Baytown Refinery on May 3rd, 1927. The freight agent in Baytown was operating out of a rolling depot, a boxcar, by May 7th. At first, freight business was slow, but after a year, an average of 50 freight cars were coming from Humble Oil. Now, with the direct connections with Houston, Missouri Pacific told Humble Oil that they would provide passenger service to the annual Humble Day picnic on May 11th if the four new lightweight passenger cars arrived so that the Houston office employees could attend the event. On May the 11th, 1927, Humble Oil employees were taken from Houston Union Station on the steam train and arrived about 9.30 a.m. in Baytown. The three new electric cars operated on a limited schedule between Houston and Baytown that day. Because of lack of information, the outbound trips were poorly used, but the return inbound trips were well filled. The track was in such condition that no attempt was made to schedule regular service. Ballast and upgrades were continued. In the latter part of May, Harry K. Johnson signed the transfer of the stock, assets, debts, and other obligations to the BSL and WMP, giving him full time to devote to real estate developments. Regular passenger service began on June the 19th of 1927 with 774 paying customers. A second ticket agent had to be added to accommodate the first day's activity. The four new interurban cars were in constant use. The projected cost of the railway had been estimated at 2,500,000. The total recorded cost of the construction of the Houston North Shore Railway was $1,973,628 exclusive of the land. There was 26.81 miles of main track with 10 miles of yard track and switch track. From the Goose Creek Station to Union Station, the passenger cars covered 33.36 miles of track with 6.55 miles over the Houston Electric Streetcar tracks. Rufus K. McComb operated probably the first commercial enterprise outside of farming and ranching in what is now Highlands. He established a ferry across the San Jacinto River at the end of Wallaceville Road. The San Jacinto Rice Company was founded in 1902. J.W. Denny was manager of the Rice Company. Eventually, salt water was unawarely pumped from the San Jacinto River, destroying the Rice Company. A hotel, probably the first business structure, was built on Crosby Lynchburg Road, near where Charlie's Ice House is presently located. Built as housing for the rice field workers, it had some 50 rooms and a commissary. Later, it was home for the first post office in what is now Highlands. The first post office was named Alina. 
the rice company planted 600 acres in fig trees. This brought about the establishment of the canning plant on Wallaceville Road. Harry K. Johnson purchased land from Tyrell and Garth and established Highlands Farms and planted some 240 acres of strawberries. By 1929, Tyrell and Garth had built the canning plant. At its peak, the plant was canning up to 30,000 pounds of figs during season. They also built a cotton gin and a water tower to serve the community. After the railroad came, the number of businesses began to grow. Some early ones were T.L. Chandler's General Store, H.A. Brown's Grocery, Harrington Cleaners, Rosser's Gulf Station, Rosser's Sawmill, Elda's Memorial Hospital, and Highlands Drug Store. In the 1950s, Highlands experienced a great deal of expansion, and it continues on today. New fire station, library, parks, and new businesses keep Highlands in the mainstream of growth, yet retains its hometown appeal. I'm Vern Miller. I'm from East Texas and moved to Highlands in 1982. I'm a newcomer. Uh, Concerning the agriculture here, um, in 1902, Terrell and Garth started the San Jacinto Rice Company, which uh, it did very well. They built a school in Highlands for the workers' children. And by 1918, uh, the rice. Uh, began to, the demand was going down for it, plus we had uh, salt water got into the crops and, and we pretty well lost that. And so they, they made a comeback with uh, 600 acres of uh, fig trees. And uh, Terrell and Garth, uh, by 1922, uh, had bought 17,000 acres of this property around here and sold smaller parcels to uh, small farmers. And of course they planted all types of vegetables and had a wide variety of things. Um, by 1926, Harry K. Johnson had planted uh, 250 acres, roughly, of strawberries. Uh, He's responsible, Harry Kay is responsible for the inner urban uh, coming through Highlands, which it served to carry uh, strawberries and figs and so forth raised here to the markets. He donated the property for the depot. Uh, later he developed a lot of the land by selling lots in the area. Um, Terrell and Garth, of course, they're responsible for the canning plant on Wallaceville Road. Uh, at one time, uh, they were they were canning twenty to thirty thousand pounds of figs a week. And that's a lot of figs. Uh, so they needed three carloads of sugar. I can't imagine. That's a lot. That's a lot of sugar. Uh, as the war in 1940-41, as the war started to end uh, or wind down, I guess uh, they people planted victory gardens in this area, uh, and it, it helped them to pull through. It was during the hard times right in there. So that's that's about it on the. I think we did move to Crosby uh, about 1922 or three, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, then moved the sawmill down here to Highlands uh, during, during 1926. Was it called Highlands at that time? Yeah, this was Highlands Township. Okay. Okay. Harry K. Johnson had just, just got it started and had staked off the town sites. Yeah. Um, what was it like in Highlands at that point? What, what was here then? Well, when you asked that question a while ago, was, was there Highlands then? There really wasn't Highlands. There were four or five houses here. <laughs> but the, the plots were laid out. Yeah. And the post office was uh, 
in Alina, mm -hmm. and it was they were called the old Alina farm thing, and the rice farm, raw rice farms, it preceded the pig farms and all the rest of Highlands, but it was called Alina, and the post office was Alina, and that's where we got our mail at Alina, Alina, Texas, and uh, we. I don't know how long that lasted, but it, 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 but it was, at that time, Harry K. Johnson had already named it, his yeah. town, yeah. Highlands, mm -hmm. Highlands Town Sites, what he called it. And uh, so, we, we, when I say we, I'm talking about my family. My dad bought some, some lots up here, right off the side of the railroad, and about early 27, I guess it was, I, I was, we were here when they unloaded the first interurbans for the uh, railroad. Mm -hmm. And of course, Harry K. Johnson was very much here then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we uh, ran that mill and bought timber around different places and off the edges of these farms and things around here. And that's the way I was raised. And, hand, and lumber and logs. And well, y'all did rough cutting? Y'all didn't do any planing, did Oh, yeah. We had a good planing mill, even had a molding mill for a while, but never did use it, I don't think. Well, Where was that, the mill located? Well, if you go right across the railroad track on 8th Street, it's just, just the other side of the railroad tracks, uh, west of 8th Street. 8th Street just died out there. That yeah. was the <laughs> end of Highlands there, actually. <laughs> the end of 8th Street was the end of the town site. Yeah. And uh, that's where the mill was. Okay, now obviously you sold a lot of wood and lumber around here to people to build houses, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, well, now was Spivey Lumber Company or any of those well, around it yet? Came, it came here somewhere early in those days. I don't know exactly mm -hmm. when Spivey came. Yeah. But there was another uh, sometime during that time also. The Parker Parker Brothers came mm -hmm. here. <coughs> And had a lumber yard. Originally, we, my family, made uh, ran that sawmill, but sold lumber uh, to uh, on a wholesale basis. Yeah, I yeah, guess yeah. you'd call it. Yeah, yeah. wasn't really cutting them for, wasn't really making lumber for houses. But when we moved here, then we did start well selling lumber for houses and made all kinds of lumber that go in the house. Two four two or sixes and ship flap and whatever. Mm. Okay. And of course that was what we really had for a number of years. And then the Parker Brothers had this lumber yard that they had. And they were more of a carpenter family. Yeah. We weren't ever we were never carpenters. <laughs> we were sawmillers. Sawmillers. Well, now was there any other saw sawmills around here at the time? Well, right right at that time there were not. Okay. But. Um, I see. I don't Another know. used to be one on Thompson Road down. Well, that now that's that's the one that we had had. Mm -hmm. And uh, when my dad went out of business, he sold his sawmill equipment to Mr. Prince. Oh, okay. It's Ray Prince's yeah, father. Yeah. And he had he put that mill down there three three corners. Yeah, yeah. Triangle they call yeah, it. Yeah, triangle. Yeah, yeah. And uh, here we. We cut some, actually cut some timbers mm -hmm. for a uh, shipyard. Yeah. And they, we made a bunch of those that would be 16 by 16 by whatever length we cut them, you know, depending yep. on the size of the timber. Which shipyard was that? It's the one down at Lynchburg. Okay. I think they called it Lynchburg. It was at Lynchburg. Okay. And uh, they would pull up. Fair size boats, mm -hmm. up on, and those uh, those timbers were laid crossways of the rails to, to pull the thing up on, <coughs> and that's where the keel of the ship mm -hmm. was set on those timbers. Mm -hmm. So uh, we got quite a few of that kind of thing. Well, that's pretty good. That probably was pretty good money back then. Well, it was during the time of the depression was coming on. <laughs> Any kind of money was good money. <laughs> well, and yeah. actually. You did uh, ran some small tie mills mm -hmm. and cut ties mm -hmm. uh, on a smaller yeah. version of a sawmill. 
they set up a mandrel and saw and whatever equipment now, went with it. Now you'd have to send those off to have them uh, chrysoded, wouldn't you? What? And didn't you have to? Oh have yeah, they would be chrysoded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, for railroad ties. Yeah. No, there wasn't anybody. There wasn't a chrysoded place around here, was there? Yeah, over at Sheldon. Okay. There was a, off the railroad over there. I guess that's Southern Pacific. It yeah. goes through there. And they had creosote plants, so what, what, what ties we cut during that time were so either we hauled them there to be creosoted or mm -hmm. take them and somebody came and bought them and took them there to be creosoted, yeah. but they did have and creosoted a lot of ties. And they also, we didn't do it, but they creosoted uh, hand hewn mm -hmm. cross ties. Okay. And the railroad didn't really have them, and there's another reason for that. So Why is that? Because of the surface. It is rougher? I saw a, uh, a tie, or lumber that's rough cut, mm -hmm. and all kinds of little yeah. uh, stickers up on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the hand hewn, once the surface tends to be smooth shaven, oh, okay. smooth like yeah. that. And it doesn't take up water from rains as bad as the uh, one that you saw. So those things just about had to be uh, creosoted. Now, how, how long did the mill stay in business? When did it, when did well, it go Well, off and on, I said from 1926 mm -hmm. till about uh, 1940, okay. somewhere along in there. Did you work there the whole time? Uh, yeah. <laughs> from, from the time I got out of, out of grade school. <laughs> Well, I, I hauled strips when I was just a kid in one of the bigger mills where they yeah, yeah. have to move strips to stack lumber on. Now, have you all, have you always worked in the mill business like this? I mean, that's about all I ever did. Okay, I was raised up in it. Okay, yeah, and uh, work hard. It's hard work, yeah. and I even haul logs some. But you know, about that time, then the, somewhere along in there, the depression really got going, yeah. and that's. Most of my growing up time was in the Depression years. And then everybody else around here <coughs> that grew up during that time. <coughs> well, did you did you know Harry K. Johnson? Huh? You. Did you know Harry K. Johnson? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I knew Harry K. Johnson. <laughs> okay. Sure did. Did y'all get along with each other? Oh, yeah. <laughs> ah, well, geez, wait there. Well, sure did. <laughs> yeah, he was a great old man. Yeah. He really was a great old man. What were some of the earliest businesses in Highlands? What were some of the first ones you can remember? Oh, that uh, rice woman business, and then Tierland Garth came in and planted figs, and they had the uh, Tierland Garth farms. Mm -hmm. and that was a big business, and they built a canning plant, had that canning plant here during most of that time. Okay. Yeah. And uh, then <laughs> beyond that is grocery stores. <laughs> Okay. Well, like I said, I, you know, you know, I can remember some of the grocery stores that yeah. were here, but I know there there were some before Eddings, you know, and everything. Oh yeah. Because I remember down at Four Corners, the Bairds had a had, yeah, a, had one down did. there, mm -hmm. uh, a little grocery store and so forth like that. Well, let's see, Joe Walsick had a barber shop down yeah. there. Yeah. Now he came down here from Crosby. Oh after, yeah. After we came here. Joe and Molly. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. Yep. Yep. He cut my hair when I was. In Second grade at the Crosby. <laughs> He's not that old, is he? Yes, he is. Joe Walsey was. Yeah, yeah, okay. Old enough to cut my hair when I was a little kid. <laughs> but no, uh, yeah, and see, Rogers Dry Goods Store came in. Uh, Rogers, yeah, 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 she came in sometime or another. Didn't yeah, but All those people came after we came in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Including most, uh, I guess, just about all the grocery stores because uh, the, uh, I guess you'd call it the commissary-like thing that the uh, rice farming people had up at Alina. Mm -hmm. That's where people traded and okay. bought their groceries and stuff, and that's where the post office was before the Highlands was named Highlands. Yeah. Now, when, when did O'Hines Muldrow show up? He showed up, Lord knows. It was after we were here. Okay. But his... Uh, his father-in-law, not his father-in-law, Blanche's, Blanche Denny, old man Denny, that's the one I'm yeah. trying to think about. Yeah. 
Mr. Denny had a little store up right where uh, San Jacinto Street now. See, there wasn't a San Jacinto Street. Yeah. Like Harry K. Johnson yeah. laid all these streets yeah. out. Yeah. And uh, when we moved here, what streets they were, was, they just graded them up, put some shell on them. Yeah. And even the road down from Crosby through to Lynchburg was all shell road. Yeah. And uh, then when they did put in streets, most of them were shell, if they had anything on them at all. But they didn't all have anything on them for a while. Uh, San Jacinto Street was one of the first ones that they, uh, well, they, Got through, they yeah. actually made into a street. Did you ever ride the Unurban? I rode it for miles and miles and for years. See, after, in 19 and when we were living here, and I rode it when I was just a kid, a lot of times from here up to town to go to school. Then uh, a lot of people here were beginning to get jobs at the, at the yeah. Humble Refinery. And when I got old enough, uh, I went down and got a job. That was in 42. But I had worked in Somerville, and then I had worked in the lumber yard after we shut down over here. I worked in Lumber Yard in Houston. Got a job back out here at the refinery, and that's where I stayed until uh, I finished my <laughs> work. How many years did you work at the refinery? I worked it for the Humble for about 31 years. Okay. A good part of it was in the refinery, mm -hmm. but I spent about the six, last six or seven years of my time with them. I was working in the Houston office, okay. headquarters office. Now, there was a lot of people here in Highlands that worked at that refinery, wasn't there? Well, not everybody that moved in here, that's where they got a job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the, that, the, a uh, depression was coming on during all this yeah. time, and these people were a part of the two-bit gang, you know. <laughs> and of course, they were, the two-bit gang was going there before I went to work, but I worked in Houston somewhere else for a while. And when I got on down at Baytown, I think they were paying maybe, it seemed like 89 cents an hour, yeah. top wages about that time. That was big money. Oh, yeah, it was, enough to, <laughs> it was enough to have a family on, you know. <laughs> but there was a lot of people that made it through the early part of the refinery, and the two, two big gang, of course, just, the, the uh, humble people just kept people on and, 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 to, have, yeah. to have people. You yeah. don't have a job. Yeah. Well, and uh, so a lot of the people that were here were like that. So this was basically uh, Baytown and, and Highlands were both basically refinery family towns. Mm, okay. But, what, but then when you got to these stores and things, there was a turnover all the time. Yeah, yeah. And my wife could probably name some of those stores better than I can. But uh, the Denny's had that store and Heine, Hines, and we mm -hmm. called him Heine. Hines uh, married Denny's daughter, yeah. Blanche. And of course, they, then they had just ran that store for a long time, for years, yeah. Yeah. up there in Highlands. <laughs> and the, the, the Muldrow boys still have what's left over the property and stuff that, that Hines had, had bought. So I don't know how much they got. When did the first drugstore come to town? To, to my memory, oh, it was probably Doc Waters. Yeah, yeah, before Associate. Yeah, probably before Associate. Yeah. I'm sure it was. Yeah. And Doc Waters, he was a doctor and he also had a drugstore. Yeah. We couldn't call it a pharmacy, a drugstore. But uh, I appreciate the time and everything like yeah. that, you know. And you raised how many kids there? Huh? How many kids did you raise here in Highlands? Kids. I man. know what you said, but I'm trying to figure out how many I've got. In 1940. Okay. Where did you come from? From, uh, Bay well, Evergreen. Evergreen. Oh, you lived on the Evergreen Road out. Well, I, I, I lived on the bay oh. in the humble, in the what? humble houses. They there. had the humble barracks out there back then. Uh, yes, okay, I remember that. 
Well, you moved to Highlands when? You got married and moved to Highlands? Is that what you did? Right. I'm married in 1940, and my... Uh, my husband had a had built a new home for me next door. Okay. So, Wasn't this one here we're in now then? No, it's the one next door. Oh. I moved in next door to his <laughs> mother and father. Well, what did you think about it when you what did you think about Highlands when you first moved here? Well, it was small, but man uh it had a lot of Clubs and things, uh, libraries, and uh, just a lot of group. Yeah. It really, I really liked it. Did you ever go to the old Riverview Inn down there or anything? Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> I'm telling you, uh, that was. That was Mr. Thompson's place, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. And, that's the uh, only entertainment we had around for a while, right? That's right. And when I went, uh, <laughs> Mr. Thompson, uh, my daddy was very strict, and he <laughs> and and Mr. Thompson told Daddy he would always look after me. Oh, well, that's good. Now, yeah, do y'all know any special stories you need to tell that she needs to tell about? <laughs> well, my mother, uh, a possum woke her up in the middle of the night and she took her baseball bat after it and anyway, <laughs> you tell the rest of the story, my mother. Oh, uh, we had had a storm. And it was a, and it was he, uh, Carla. It was 61, oh, yeah. okay, yeah. Was yeah. And he was on the back steps. And the dogs kept barking, and, and so I went out and just I saw what it was to shoo him away, and he wouldn't go away. And I went out and I had a baseball back. I wouldn't have hit him, but he went at me, <laughs> <laughs> and I got him. Uh oh! But then the rest of the story is yeah. She, uh, Daddy took the possum down to the the docks and Harriet was there huh. and he threw the possum in the water it was actually a female and the baby started coming out and so Harriet saw that and she grabbed the to the line that was holding the barge threw it out for the possums to, to crawl up huh. and the barge started going down the river and they had to go get it in a tugboat <laughs> <laughs> Just to save the possums, huh? Yeah, right. Oh, man, oh, man. Well, uh, what was any highlights? You're bound to have had some fun around this place, huh? A lot of good memories? Well, let's see. The Girl Scouts, you did the Girl Scouts. The Scouts and the Little League and the book clubs. And Everything I joined, they elected me president, and I didn't <laughs> like that, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, did you ever go to the little library down there? Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. It was about this big. Oh, you know, like I said. In but, fact, I guess it was, well, it was one of your relatives that ran it, wasn't it? Or it was one of Jean's, I think. Jean's on the other side. Yeah, I yeah. yeah. can't remember what her name was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, but it was yeah. so. Wasn't that Mrs. Davis uh, that was the first? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was. Uh, yeah. It's now the Chamber of Commerce building. Yeah, yeah, yeah but I think that was the library then. Yeah. And I think she ran it. And I think. She's some way uh, related to Gary. Yeah, 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 yeah. right. Yeah. She is. Well, like I said, uh, you were out here kind of in the prairie and everything like that, you know. You, you had electricity by then, I'm sure, but did you have a water well here and everything? Oh, yes. I, we had everything. Did you have any livestock? No. All right. Well, <laughs> no livestock. No livestock. Okay. Well. We just, uh, we had a lumber yard was in the back. Mm, okay. Did it operate out of here always? Yeah. It, yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Because, like I said, the only one I can think of that I can really remember was Spivey. You know, yeah. of course, I was a kid back then. Yeah, right. And then, uh, like I said, there was another one, and then Roy Loggins got into business, but that was late in the 60s. Oh, yeah. He'd gone right, on right. for a while. Everything. This was in the 40s. Yeah. Uh, he had the lumber mill back then. Yeah, okay. Well, then you wanted to tell about this was Bob and Poppy's house on Battle Bell, and then, then you built the house back there, and the pecan orchard in the back, and all the. All the narcissists and daffodils that, from Holland that grow up in January. Yeah. The bug planting. Oh, they have two and a half acres of. You ought to come out and take pictures there. Uh, narcissus and, mm -hmm. and the daffodils. Mm -hmm. or, or, or just come out and see them because they're, they're very still, lovely. Still, still growing and still blooming, huh? Really yes. Bulbs came from Holland. Hmm. And bulbs. Them. Yeah, and the thing is, uh, they're gorgeous when they come through, but you have to let them cure off before yeah. you can okay. mow them. And what, did y'all used to sell them or anything, or did y'all just, no, just, just raise them? we just raised them. Just we raised never them. did sell any, yeah. but... Bub was a master gardener. Okay. Or at least, I mean, she had... Ten green thumbs. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, now, how many years were you married? Thirty-one. Thirty-one. Okay. Yeah. And, that's, uh, and I was saying I, I've, I've been a widow for thirty-one years, too. <laughs> yeah, this is true. It's a long yeah, time. Yeah, it's a long time. Well, I'm not going to tell you how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can do some simple math there. No. <laughs> yeah, you sure can. <laughs> 85 is not hard to add, is it? <laughs> now, did you ever ride that in urban back and forth to Baytown, or did y'all pretty well have a car most of the time? We had a car. Yeah, okay. But my sister uh, used to come out on the weekends. She rode it. Mm -hmm. from. Um, she'd catch it at school in Baytown yeah. and come out here on the weekend. That was every weekend. Yeah, yeah. Just about. Lois. Lois, yeah. Yeah. Well, you remember the drugstore here in Highlands, don't you? Did you ever go to the drugstore here? Oh, yes, and Harry. He has a job set out for him. Well, have you talked to Miss Johnson since y'all rolled in this morning yet? Yes, she just offered us all coffee, but I told her we'd wait till we got the car off the, the uh, truck before we started getting any uh, coffee. Sounds good. She's not too upset. Man. Oh, no. She's quite aware and, and very happy, in fact, delighted over what she's seen happening so I was going to so say, she hadn't seen this thing in how many years? I don't know how long it's been. I'm sure 1948 would be pretty close. Yeah, okay.